Traveling north of Calvert Mansion, we go downhill until we meet the shore. Lying just off coast in the shallow waters, we see a wreck. Ozyman... Ozyman... Ozymandias? Perhaps there is some pre-war treasure aboard this vessel. Swimming on over, we can climb upon the rock that the ship has crashed into, and as we get closer, we can better read the name of this vessel. Ozymandias. Climbing aboard, we see a few shipping containers, some barrels and trash, but not much else. Although we do find a hatch that leads inside. After climbing below deck, we find ourselves standing in a room that's tipped on its side. It's hard to stand straight and keep our footing in here. There is a water leak from one of the main pipes, and a thick mist permeates the room. Turning on our Pip-Boy light, we can better explore. To the south-southwest, we find a first aid box next to some wall-hanging naval cots, where the crew must have slept. There's a big pile of scrap to the southeast. Gravity has dragged most of the loose items in this vessel to this location. In this junk pile, we find a bit of scrap and some railway spikes. Some sort of big vat to the east spouts a steady stream of water, but the most prominent feature is a terminal next to a large safe on a table to the north. The terminal reads, Bish Company Terminal. Bish Energy Partners, Natural Gas Survey Vessel, USS Ozymandias. We find a number of entries. We'll start by reading the mission parameters. Bish Energy Partners has authorized Natural Gas Survey Project MD-16001 to perform field research. Private contractor Caroline Saunders shall be present as principal geological chemist on behalf of Bish Natural Gas Company. Local authorization for this expedition is granted in agreement with the Isla Negra Real Estate Company, with representatives located locally. Principal chemist Saunders is to take multiple soil samples and report on concentration of natural gas resources. Her spoken authorization signature will be needed on at least three survey sites to conduct further research in this area. Should these authorizations be granted, use this terminal to access expeditionary supplies to continue data gathering while Bish Company extraction crews are assembled. Intern research assistants are K. Lovett, M. Roach, L. Rourke, and P. Antoine. All right, so it looks like this ship was part of an expedition to Point Lookout to see whether or not this place would be good for harvesting natural gases. They hired a geologist, Caroline Saunders, to do the principal research on this expedition. If during her survey, she finds at least three sites that are rich in this natural gas and gives vocal authorization, then the expedition will be allowed to gather more data using the supplies in this safe. So in short, we need to find three vocal records from Caroline Saunders to open this safe. On a side note, Bethesda included a bit of an Easter egg here. Much of the land that Bish Energy was exploring to look for natural gases was owned by the Isla Negra Real Estate Company. Isla Negra, Black Isle. Black Isle, of course, being the developer of the first two Fallout games. After this, we find options to enter three authorization codes. Nothing happens when we select these now because we don't have the codes on us. Looks like this is where we go to input the vocal authorization codes that we need to go look for at the three survey sites. The final entry, however, appears to be some sort of glitch. Error 12XU, user shell. Error, security database corrupt. Inside we see two entries, the first confidential. Task details, Point Lookout Survey Expedition, Martin J. Roach. Oh, this was one of the research assistants that worked under Caroline Saunders listed in the previous entry. For your eyes only, dear Dr. Roach, on behalf of the Bish Company, thank you for accepting this contract. You will be posing as a research intern, reporting to principal geologist Caroline Saunders. Her experience with wetlands excavation makes her the only real suitable candidate. However, Saunders is a known liberal with academic ties. We have only recently acquired excavation rights in this area. We believe that the mass burials of the American Civil War in this region have made the soil ripe for our purposes. This is the very same reason we are apprehensive about Saunders' liberal leanings. Your primary mission is to prevent Saunders from discovering the link between Point Lookout's bloody past and its probable richness in natural biogas resources. Code Blue protocols are authorized per your discretion. 
Saunders must be prevented from hampering this resource at every cost. Oh my god. So the only reason they were here is because they theorized that this land was rich in biofuel from the decomposed bodies of the Civil War Confederate soldiers buried in mass graves here in Point Lookout. They were going to exploit the deaths of all of those people to make a quick buck on this resource. Directly beneath this confidential entry is a blank one, and it's partially garbled, but we can make some of it out. Code Blue Protocol for immediate implementation. We believe Saunders has made contact, academic contact. Wire communication records that Saunders is attempting to something. Lie concentrations associated with decomposed. Enact Code Blue Protocol. Leave no evidence. So Caroline Saunders discovered something that caused Martin Roach to enact code blue protocols. What was it she discovered? And what were these code blue protocols? After leaving the terminal, we begin the quest, an antique land. And we must now head out into the swamp to find three of the survey sites. It will take a lot of exploring to discover these three sites because the entrances are small and easy to miss. Thankfully, most of these sites are a stone's throw away from other prominent locations. The first site, for example, is just north of the Trash Heap. I will be covering all of these other minor locations like the Trash Heap in an upcoming video. As we approach, we see a big, bubbling pool of irradiated muck, and it's guarded by feral ghouls. The brain fungus growing here tells us that this is a site of rot and decay. We see the remains of a small shack or lean-to that was at one time constructed here. There is no appreciable loot inside, but just next to it, we see a big, muddy mound with a hole in it. And sticking out of the hole is a ladder to the excavated muck hole. At the bottom of the ladder, we find ourselves in a cave. Our distorted vision tells us that we are surrounded by flammable gases. Indeed, we see vents of flammable gas rising from the floor of the cave. In the middle of this cave, we find a table, upon which is an advanced radiation suit, some small scrap, a blasted out terminal, and a holotape. Soil survey tape number one. This is Caroline Saunders, Principal Geological Chemist for Bish National Gas Survey MD-16001. Sample set one shows promising concentration of biogas in mostly limestone substratum of wetlands. No exact levels yet, but this site should exhibit more than enough extraction potential to meet survey goals. I'm going to leave a couple of interns here to handle the minutia, but it's a formality. I'll move on to the other sites now to make sure this isn't an aberration. Consider this my authorization signature on sample site one. So Caroline Saunders successfully found concentrations of biogas in some of the limestone. And if this room is any indication, this land is indeed rich with gas. It's a good thing we're not walking around with a flamer. That pilot light could set us all ablaze. And we see that the radiation levels here are natural. Even before the war, high levels of radiation emanated from this hole, hence the advanced radiation suit we found on the table. Even in a full suit of T-51 power armor, I had to start popping Radex and Rad away just to survive. We do find one skeleton lying on the ground near the table, but our only indication as to who this might belong to is Saunders' mention of the interns she left behind. But she did say interns, plural, giving us the impression she left more than one. So why then do we see only one corpse? To leave, we climb up the ladder, and now we need to find the second excavation site. We stumble upon the second site when we explore the land east of the Little Tyke's Playhouse. As we approach, we see two ghouls, a glowing one and a feral ghoul reaver. And 
just like the last site, here we see mounds upon mounds of brain fungus. We see evidences of the excavation site. We find a big stack of boxes lying next to a rusted table upon which we find a toolbox. Nearby we also see two construction lamps and a generator. Looks like the expedition dug these holes even at night. Nearby, we see a stark reminder as to the source of this natural gas that the Bish Company is trying to excavate. We see a small burial plot with only three graves. If we have a shovel, we can open up these graves where we find lever-action rifles, confederate hats, and human flesh. These three were lucky. Their graves had headstones. Their plot fenced off by a white picket fence. How many of the dead were dumped into mass graves that litter this swamp with no other record that they ever existed? The entrances to these excavation sites are often difficult to find, but after wandering around, we eventually find the glossy mound that leads to excavation site number two. Just like the last one, we find ourselves in a vaulted cave-like room filled with flammable gas. But here we find a much more grisly scene than in the last one. On the ground, we find the remains of two skeletons. It's kind of hard to tell the bones are a bit of a jumble. And two coffee cups. These people were drinking coffee when they were killed. Could they be more of this expedition's interns? To find out, we head over to the big table in the middle of the room. On it, we find soil survey tape number two. Caroline Saunders speaking, principal geological chemist on Bish National Gas Survey MD 16001. Preliminary results from sample site two are promising. We're posting similar concentrations as in the first site. Similar biogas makeup here as well, including a few organic compounds that I'm not familiar with. We've also discovered heavy lye residue in a naturally formed chamber at this excavation site. Lucky we were wearing caustics gear to begin with, or somebody might have suffered some serious chemical burns. I'd like to analyze the site further, see if there's any connection between these compounds and the lye deposits. My tech is telling me he needs a couple of hours to work on our ventilator unit. I suppose I'll move on to site three in the meantime. Further analysis is for my own curiosity anyway. This is my authorization signature on sample site two. It's natural that she's really curious about the high concentrations of lye, because lye is not found in nature. Certainly not in any big crystallized form underground. You don't dig into the earth and find big pockets of lye like you do marble or quartz. Instead, lye is manufactured. We make it today using electrolysis, but traditionally, lye was created by passing water through the ashes of wood. The resulting lye water would then be used in soap making. It was commonplace, even during the Civil War era, to cover corpses in lye before burial. People would cover the corpses in mass graves with lye to accelerate decomposition and to help keep the stench down. Indeed, one of the ways archaeologists search for mass graves is by testing soil for a rise in pH. Lye reduces soil acidity, which increases its pH, and if you find a whole lot of soil with high pH, you have likely found a mass grave. Finding these traces of lye was a big hint to Saunders that something here was not natural. And we can understand why Saunders was worried about chemical burns. Lye is a highly caustic substance. The two corpses we find here must be the remains of the tech team she left behind to work on the site's ventilation system. But why are we finding all of these bodies in these holes soon after Saunders has left them? In the footlocker on the table, we found a small stash of biogas canisters. These are thrown explosives that are new at this DLC, and we'll talk more about them a little later. The final site is in the far northwest corner of the map. The closest location to this is the jet crash site. As with the other locations, we find this one swarming with feral ghouls.
and as we approach the mound, we again see more piles and piles of brain fungus. Like the others, there was a rudimentary shack erected here, with a ham radio and other scrap laid about, and when ready, we can climb down the ladder to the third excavated McColl. Unlike the others, this one is flooded with water, but like the others, it too is filled with flammable gas. This room is much smaller, and 200 years later, still lit by a construction light attached to a generator. We find what we are looking for to the northeast. On the ground, we see an intact human skeleton, surrounded by a clipboard, pencils, more of those biogas canisters, a couple of stim packs, and soil survey tape number three. What in the world have we tapped into? Sample site three is showing biogas concentration off the charts. Wetland substratum is surprisingly dense limestone at all excavation sites, and we've had no trouble locating naturally formed chambers. This and the dense calcite formation suggest that subterranean water flow has eroded a vast network of caves and grottos throughout the region. Mapping these will be a monumental effort and necessary to fully uncover the bounty of natural gas resources captured down here. What I don't understand is the amount of lye residue we're encountering. I'm going to try and touch base with some of my academic contacts and see if we can find any precedent for it. We'll have plenty of time to work that out, though. I've no doubt Bish will want to set up shop here and drill their little hearts out. This is Principal Geological Chemist Caroline Saunders for Bish National Gas Survey MD 16001. Consider this my authorization signature on sample site 3. As far as I'm concerned, this is a prime location for biogas harvesting and a treasure trove for some field research. She said that she wanted to reach out to her academic contacts because she was confused by the lie deposits. But remember, she was being followed by Martin Roach, who was only posing as an intern and who was instead spying on her actions, ready at any moment to enact the Code Blue protocol that leaves no evidence. At the end of the previous holotapes, she always mentioned that she was leaving someone behind, which could possibly explain the corpses we found there, but this time she did not mention leaving anyone behind, and yet we find this skeleton. My bet is that this is the corpse of Caroline Saunders. She supposedly left two interns at site number one, one of whom may have been Martin Roach. My bet is that when Caroline Saunders left site number one, Martin killed the other intern there, whose body we found. He then followed Caroline to site number two, where he found the tech workers that Caroline had left behind to set up proper ventilation. He killed them as well while they were drinking coffee. And at last, he followed Caroline to pit number three, where he heard her record this holotape, mentioning something about academic contacts. And so, to leave no evidence behind, he killed her where she stood, and as her body collapsed to the ground, she dropped her clipboard, pencils, and this holotape. That is, admittedly, my interpretation of the evidence that we find. I am, of course, curious as to your interpretation. What picture would you paint, given the evidence that we've seen? At any rate, we finally have all three audio samples, and with them in hand, we can head back to the USS Ozymandias. Once inside, we can go on over to the terminal, where we find that we can now enter all three authorization codes. Once the final code is verified, we can now access expedition supplies. And once done, we complete the quest in antique land, and we can loot the nearby safe. Inside, we find two advanced radiation suits and ten biogas canisters. The biogas canisters are a new, unique, thrown explosive, and they're exceptionally rare. The only ones we can find in the game are the ones we collect during this quest. There are 10 in this safe and only 7 in the excavated muckles, meaning that there are only 17 in the entire game. Now, as for the stats on these suckers, they're pretty interesting. Throwing the grenade releases a cloud of the natural gas from these excavation sites. These clouds of gas can then be ignited with weapon fire. If thrown at an enemy wielding weapons, the enemy could themselves inadvertently ignite these big balls of gas. These are also great for placing gas traps. If we know an enemy is walking a certain direction, we can place the gas trap, allow the enemy to walk into it, and then set it on fire. 
This quest is filled with references to the 19th century British poet Pierce Bysshe Shelley. The chemical company, of course, that came here to excavate the gas was called Bish Energy Partners, which directly uses the middle name of Pierce Bish Shelley. But the expeditionary ship, whose wreckage we explore where we find this quest, is named after Shelley's 1818 poem called Ozymandias. The poem contemplates how kings and emperors and rulers, full of Pride and hubris will talk about how strong they are, how mighty their empires are, and yet ultimately their empires always end. All that remains are the ruins, the ashes. Shelley was possibly inspired to write this poem when he learned that the British Museum of London had acquired the younger Memnon statue of Ramses II. It had made the news at the time and arrived in London just after the publication of his poem. Indeed, the name of the poem, Ozymandias, is the Greek rendition of the first part of Pharaoh Ramses' royal or throne name, which in Egyptian sounded like Usurmatre. This quest gets its name from the first line of Shelley's poem, which points out the irony of seeing boastful carvings on the ruins of ancient monuments. His poem starts like this. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my work, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. This, I think, is such a brilliant allusion to the world of Fallout. Here this poem talks about finding the ruins of a civilization that thought itself so grand, so mighty in its day, and yet all these years later, all that is left is sand and ruin. And in Fallout, we find the remains of a once great civilization that thought itself the peak of power and might in the universe. But 200 years later, that power is gone, that once great civilization scattered to the winds. Shelley had a friend named Horace Smith. They were both poets. And at the time Shelley wrote Ozymandias, he had a friendly competition with Horace to write a similar poem about a similar theme. He too wrote a poem named Ozymandias, referencing the same statue and espousing the same moral theme about hubris. I think the very ending of his poem could be spoken by any wastelander standing over the once magnificent ruins of pre-war America. In Egypt's sandy silence, all alone, stands a gigantic leg, which far off throws the only shadow that the desert knows. I am the great Ozymandias, saith the stone, the king of kings. This mighty city shows the wonders of my hand. The city's gone, not but the leg remaining to disclose the sight of this forgotten Babylon. We wonder, and some hunter may express wonder like ours, when through the wilderness, where London stood, holding the wolf in chase, he meets some fragment huge, and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. It's experiences like these that show us just how much thought and attention go into every aspect of these games, and I for one am so very glad that they took the time. But what are your thoughts on Ozymandias and the quest in Antique Land? Did you find all three excavation mounds? What went through your head when you learned that this pre-war company, Bish Energy, came here to harvest fuel produced by the decaying bodies of Civil War soldiers broken down by lie and buried in the swamps of Point Lookout? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. There are so many fascinating stories like this left to explore in Point Lookout. Never fear, we will cover each and every one of them with a fine-toothed comb. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. I'm dedicating the next week or so to finishing up Point Lookout, so if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next episode in this series, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. 
Follow me on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with all Oxhorn news. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.